the second part are the EU institutions themselves, the EU institutions. Now, within the EU, there are, in fact, no less than five key lawmaking institutions. Five key lawmaking institutions. What these are meant to do, these institutions, is to balance both EU interests with national interests. EU interests with national interests, which is why we do have this tension. So the UK has said, I'm not at all concerned with what the EU comes up with in terms of refugees. We are not taking any, or we will take 5,000. But we are not going to work with the EU on this, because there is a balance between European interests and national interests, and we don't always strike that balance. Now, the first key institution is the European Council itself, the European Council. And the European Council is made up of the heads of each member state. What the heads of each member state do is effectively instigate, they direct policy objectives for the EU. They also approve and reject proposals that are put forward by another institution, the European Commission. Let's be clear. The European Council does not possess any lawmaking authority. Does not possess any lawmaking authority. Why not? And the answer is in the, is the sessions that we had in the previous weeks. Why would the European Council not have any lawmaking power? Bingo. Tell us more, Eric. What? So we have the executive branch of the EU, and the European Council is the executive branch of the EU. It is made up of the heads of states of each member state, the head of state of each member state. It is the executive wink. The second one is the Council of the EU, and here we need to be clear. The Council of the EU is distinct from the Council of Europe and is distinct from the European Council. <laughs> so the Council of Europe we spoke about last week, an alliance that handles matters of democracy, of human rights, of rule of law. The European Council is the first institution which is made up of the heads of states of each member state. And then we have the Council of the EU. Not the Council of Europe, but the Council of the EU. So we understand. Europe, we think geographically. EU, we think institutionally. So it is the Council of the Institution. It is sometimes referred to as the Council of Ministers, just to complexify the matter a little bit further. Now, this is composed of national representatives, national representatives, national representatives who are instructed, who are empowered to pursue national interests. That's a curious one. They're empowered to pursue national interests. And they enjoy power to adopt legislation alongside the parliament. Our third institution is the commission, which you'll hear a lot about, the European Commission. Now, the European Commission is also composed of one representative from each member state. One representative from each member state. The Commission enjoys the power to propose legislation. The Commission enjoys the power to propose legislation. Other institutions must ask the Commission to propose legislation, as they cannot do so of their own volition. They do not possess that authority. Now, I said to you before that the Council of the EU possesses a lawmaking power. 
what this specifically is, they have the authority to approve the proposals that are made by the Commission. So the Commission proposes legislation, it goes before the Council of the EU, and the Council of the EU has the authority to approve it or to reject it. If they approve it, it goes further. Now you have to understand that the Commission is the one that will be proposing the legislation, the Commission is the one that negotiates treaties, the Commission is intended to pursue the interests of the EU. So it is instructed by the European Council, and then it acts at the behest of the EU itself. The European Commission is a very powerful institution within the EU. Next we have the European Parliament. European Parliament. The European Parliament, elected by national electorates, so there is an election for MEPs, members of European Parliament. There are 756 of them, 756 of them. What they're intended to do is to represent EU citizens. Now recall from earlier the Treaty of Maastricht, every citizen of a member state is also a European citizen. And European citizens are required to have representation. So as a UK citizen, they have representation within Westminster, so they hold national elections. But they are also European citizens, and so they have representation within the European Parliament. And an election takes place and they vote for the MEP. Stephanie? Now what the European Parliament has is the power to approve or to reject legislation that is proposed by the European Commission that has been approved by the Council of the EU. Because if it's rejected by the Council of the EU, well, it doesn't get to the European Parliament. So there's nothing to discuss. And the European Parliament can propose legislation, but it cannot propose legislation on the floor of the EU Parliament. It must petition the European Commission, and the European Commission decides whether it will or will not take that on board. It's a pretty straightforward process. There are more stages than what you would expect within a national system, but it still is divvied up in a very standard fashion. We have our executive, we have our legislative, and then we come to our fifth institution, which is our judiciary. And that is the Court of Justice of the European Union, sometimes referred to as the ECJ, the European Court of Justice. Judges are appointed by the European Council, which is made up of who? Ah, uh, yes, head of states, precisely. The executive, in the same way that appointing judges is an executive prerogative within the UK. What the judges are meant to do is to ensure that EU law is interpreted and enforced in a harmonious fashion across the whole of the EU. The court also enjoys final authority on the interpretation of the treaties, including specifically the treaties for the functioning of the European Union and the Treaty of the European Union, so those core ones. They are the final authority. And finally, what they also do is develop general principles in EU law. They develop general principles. So principles that are meant to be guiding, and as we'll see in the final section for today, when we speak about supremacy, principles that ultimately guide all national legislatures and all national courts.